that we'd like to draw to your attention. Um, I want to thank Miriam for bringing this in. I, I always need to be told this. Uh, daylight savings time strikes again. And uh, so I think it's at, where is Miriam? Two o'clock Saturday morning. You'll be up then, right? Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Miriam, you'll turn your clock back then. Okay. So those of you who are up at two o'clock in the morning do that. Um, I will probably be long in bed by then, but at any rate, try and do that. But the good thing about this is that uh, I expect everybody to be here on time, so <laughs> we have that. Thanks to Miriam for that. Also, we're going to celebrate two wonderful birthdays this morning. Sun Young is not here with us, right? She must be downstairs with her babies. But Jim McCartney, your birthday, right? 62 this year, is that correct? Something like that? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> happy birthday. Well, okay. well, we'll sing happy birthday later on. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yes, we are doing that. And uh, that'll be a lot of fun. I've noticed all the food that's bad for you that we'll have a good time eating now. Uh, Minji Kim, the recital is noted here in the uh, bulletin. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing Minji at our hall and uh, on the 5th and uh, oh the hat and mitten tree will be uh, a collection of they made for that and as you know the last few years we've just collected hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these uh, uh, mittens and caps and so do that interestingly enough if I'm not mistaken well I'm not mistaken that was started um, maybe 15 years ago uh, by Jane Hamill and so um, I want to thank Jane for that, and Bob, say hi to Jane, and thank her, and let her know that we're still doing that, and children, after all these years, are still getting all sorts of uh, wonderful winter clothing. So, also for those of you who were involved within the ACTA program, uh, what happened is the, the original um, benefit was supposed to be on the 8th, or not the 8th, the uh, 5th, what happened is at the last minute, uh, Jackson was given an opportunity to talk to, to be the keynote speaker in New Zealand uh, regarding the kind of project that he's involved with, and it's with 4,000 people. And, uh, and it's obviously he needs to be at that, and so we'll reschedule the, uh, the benefit. And uh, those of you who are involved with that will be happy to know that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? David? Yes. <clears throat> Last week we began our annual stewardship drive. If you haven't received your packet, uh, see me after church and uh, please fill out your pledge cards and turn them back in in a timely manner. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Grateful to Don is our liturgist and um, let us begin our worship with silence.
please join me for the call to worship found in your bulletins. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my supplications. Because He loves my Therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. And I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord, and the righteousness our God is merciful. Uh, please stand and uh, join in our opening hymn, number 430. Come sing, O Church of Joy, and please remain standing afterwards for the Apostles' Creed. Charlie? Yeah, that's 
and he said, hey, is he a nice boy? So, I'm number two and Charlie's number three, but Jesus is number one. That's the way you should do it. That's, that's okay. So, uh, who's your number one favorite friend? Who's your number two favorite friend? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you, Benjamin. I know you. Hey, so, who is your number one favorite friend? Who? Jesus. And who's your number two favorite friend? You don't have any favorite friends? <laughs> you forget. Do you have a favorite friend? Oh, stop it. <laughs> Mommy. <laughs> Who's your favorite friend? Who's your number two favorite friend? Okay, who's your number three favorite friend? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. No, you're supposed to say mommy. <laughs> Alright. What have we been talking about today? Bread, right? Um, there's a story <coughs> about Jesus. This is the story right here. Jesus sees a bunch of people, 5,000 people, and they sit down and they don't have any food to eat. And so do you know what Jesus does to feed them? What? He gives them bread. What else? You what? What'd you say? Fish. Fish. He gives them fishes and bread. And what? He touches the bread and it becomes big. And it becomes bigger? And, and also the fish. And also the fish. That's and that's how he fed everyone. And that's how he fed everyone. When Jesus touched the bread and when he touched the fishes, they got bigger. <laughs> and that's how he fed everyone. That's a pretty good explanation. I like that. What about the wine? Well, we talked about that, but you missed that wonderful time. <laughs> so if you could tell your parents that you can come back more often, I can tell you. Oh, How'd that do? Pretty good? Okay. All right. So, yeah. So who's this here? Ryan? Jesus. And what is this? What's that? Bread. Bread. And what's that? Fish. Fishes. That's right. And that's the table. And that's the table? Right here? Oh, yes, it is the table. That's why the curtains, it's from sideways to the curtains are so uh, You look at it sideways and you can see this, the curtains here, and that's, that's exactly right. So what happens is that Jesus feeds all these people. Now, do you think that they understood why Jesus fed them? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. What do you think, Logan? Mm -hmm. You don't know. What do you think? They were hungry, and that's why they ate. That's exactly right. Interestingly enough, Jesus provided enough food for them until everybody was satisfied and had as much as they needed and wanted. That's what Jesus did. Now, that's called a miracle that he took that. Yeah, that he changed, that he made it bigger. Do you believe that, that he did that? Yeah. How about you? In the Bible it's written. In the Bible it's written, so you're going to believe it, right? Good lad. Well, that's a true story. Now, I wanted to tell you that. Now, who wants to help me sing today? <coughs> you want to help me sing? Yeah. Come on, guys. Run through it, please, maestro. I love you, Lord, number six. <laughs> Thank you. 
And Minji, of course, thank you. That was wonderful. And we'll look forward to your uh, recital. You sing like an angel like you did. It'll be wonderful. I'm sure you will. Thank you again so much. Turn out our concerns of the church universal and uh, the church in particular and ask at this time if there's any one or ones <coughs> excuse me, that we need to be particularly mindful of today. 
Everything all right across uh, the Mediterranean? Yeah, it looks good. Good. Travel mercies for Reja. He's flying back home from Jordan. Okay. Did he get to see his mom? Yeah. Good. Anyone else? All right. Um, yesterday, of course, was um, Harlan Parmenter's 90th birthday, and some of us signed cards to him. So, if those of you who know Harlan or uh, Matt, you might want to send him a card and wish him a belated uh, birthday. And then we have other birthdays this week and today that we'll celebrate in just a few minutes. Jim, you're doing well, aren't you? Okay. And that's something. Fifteen months later, I like it. Well, <laughs> it's the power of Christ, and we're going to get you through this. Don't worry. Let's pray. We come to you, Lord. This is a wonderful day. Uh, not, not just because uh, it's sparkling, not just because uh, it's crisp, not just because it's beautiful, but because it's the only day that we have. Just today, it's the only day that we've been given. And because of that, we can rejoice and be glad. We can be glad living in this eternal now. And that's where we find ourselves. This eternal now. That you have given us to be about telling people good news, loving people with good news, sharing people good news feeding people with good news, healing people with good news, clothing people with good news. All of these opportunities for being about Christ-like. Um, you've given us in this 24-hour um, time frame, and that makes us a good day. It's been a good day that uh, you put before us so we can continue praying for those in this fellowship who are not well, and also for those who who are getting better. And I'm thankful that you've been in Jordan um, with Lena Elisa and that you're restoring her to, to better health as she battles cancer. We're grateful that you continue to be um, 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 with Barb um, Swanson and you re restore her um, to better health as she also is, is, is battling cancer. We ask that you be with your servant and your friend, Jim McCartney, and his beloved, as both of them have had to wrestle with very difficult um, health issues in the last 18 months. And they're with us, and they're alive, and they're getting better. And we lift them up to you, and we lift Kathleen Olds up to you, and ask that you be with her, Colleen's daughter, and restore her to good health. We give thee thanks for the birthdays that have um, that have been given us today and we're grateful for Sun Young and we're grateful for her family and we're happy uh, for Jim McCartney to celebrate yet again another birthday. We ask travel mercies for Raja as he returns um, from Jordan. We ask travel mercies <coughs> for um, Pilsu and Kyung A and baby Samuel as they prepare to leave Boston and um, come on the 13th for the baptism of their child and ask travel mercies for them. There is so much good and so much happy that's going on. We ask that your continued blessings be upon us. For those whose hearts have been broken, we would ask that you would enter their lives and gently um, restore them um, to joy. For those who have been involved with lives and moments of sin, forgive them and let them sin no more and find a better way to live authentically. For those who have been filled with anger and sarcasm, forgive them and, and instill in them um, constructive ways to be about thinking and, and, and about discourse. We pray for this country of ours. We pray for our president and ask that he would um, be about what is righteous and not expedient. We pray for his little girls, and we pray for his, his beloved wife. We ask that you abide with the leadership of our country and that you would um, somehow change their, their vision from being so self-centered to rather being Christ-like 
and if not Christ-like, that at least um, a measure of spirituality might be reflected in, in, the, in their lives. Gracious and heavenly God, we thank you for this most beautiful day. And I ask that we would all be about good works today. Um, in Christ's name, this we pray, as we pray this too. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. We continue now with the sharing of our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. singing a Korean Christian song uh, that I usually sing when I'm down and troubled by uh, something around me. Uh, the title is Why Are You Sad? Uh, it ba basically says, why are you sad? Why are you worried? What are you fearful of? I'm with you always and I will protect you. Don't discourage and look at me. I'm your God. I hope that you depend on his unchangeable promise, uh, even when you are in trouble. Oh 
John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15, page 814 in your pew Bibles, or 1642 in the large print if you'd like to follow along. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw this miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Don, always. Well, we continue um, in what's called the Book of Signs. That's one of the uh, um, titles that's been given um, a good portion of, uh, of John. Namely, that there are these miraculous signs that occur, and that somehow they they reveal who Jesus is, and and that that is helpful. Then, uh, according to Sage Dodd, long passed on uh, New Testament scholars, and that's one of the better ways 
to try and understand uh, what's, what's really going on in John. Be that as it may, uh, I thought it would be enjoyable to do these signs and take us on up to Advent and, and, and to look at them. When I um, read and reread the account of the feeding of the 5,000, I, I am struck by the matter of factness, um, uh, the matter of fact nature almost, <clears throat> of the event itself. One would think for 5,000 people being fed, this would be a, a, a cause of utter astonishment. I mean, 5,000 people is a lot of people uh, for, for, for one person to feed, and let alone somehow the logistics of getting this done. And yet the scripture seems to almost take it as uh, okay. We don't get this sense of astonishment, and I find that curious. Yes, we're given a political explanation there, there down toward the end uh, uh, from the crowd that Jesus is interpreted by the masses to be the long-awaited theocratic uh, savior who will throw off the yoke of uh, Roman domination sometime, but, but even that announcement is somewhat tepid. You don't, you don't get any <clears throat> what I'm getting about is you don't see any energy, any excitement, any, uh, any uh, amazement about what's going on here. You don't get it from the crowd, you don't get it from John, you certainly don't get it from Jesus, and I find that interesting. I do take the miracle to be true. I take it to be authentic. I take it that 5,000 men, <clears throat> in this case, um, were fed. Still, it is obvious that the miracle per se is not as important as its purpose. So if you look at this, it's not about a miracle. It's about something else. I've stated this before. Miracles are understood only through the eyes of faith. Let me go through this again, because <clears throat> just just so that everybody understands that statement, um, that miracles are understood only through the eyes of faith. <clears throat> the Israelites escape bondage in Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. As they cross the Red Sea and climb up onto dry land, uh, Pharaoh's army uh, comes uh, uh, into the Red Sea. The seas swallow them up, kill them all, according to the record, and that's that. This becomes part of the national and, and, and religious heritage of, of Israel, um, this cross into the Red Sea. Um, Miriam uh, sings this exultant song, the horse and rider is overthrown into the sea. It's just probably the oldest, one of the oldest poems in all of scripture. Absolutely wonderful. The people are excited about this. This is terrific. Um, this is what defines, well, this and the uh, that the Sinai experience, giving to the Ten Commandments and the law, this is what defines uh, the character of the Israelites. This, this miracle, okay? And they understand it that way through the eyes of faith. Their faith interprets it as such. However, for the Egyptians, there is no record of this event ever happening. For them, this was not a miracle. This was an accident. This was a uh, a freak of nature. This is whatever it was, but it certainly wasn't a miracle. Miracles are only perceived through the eyes of faith. Now, proof of this regarding this miracle of feeding the 5,000, which did happen, I do believe that. Proof of this is clear. 5,000 fed from a handful of loaves and fishes come up with a wrong conclusion about who Jesus really is. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, the miracle, for crying out loud, why didn't they understand it? This miracle, they didn't have the faith to understand it, so they misinterpreted it, and the miracle, it cannot be the focus of this particular story. It has to be something else. And I know for some people that's offensive. I've said this before, I'll say it again, if Jesus came back today, we would treat him just the same as he was treated 2,000 years ago. 
Don't think for a second that if you had the opportunity to know Jesus personally, that we'd be any different than the people who were uh, 2,000 years ago. If Jesus came to perform a miracle, we would respond the same way that uh, most of the people responded to it, which is um, okay. Or we would misinterpret it, which is what the disciples did. All I'm arguing is the miracle itself is not what's going on in this story. It's the correct interpretation of it that matters. It is the interpretation of the miracle through the eyes of faith that give a miracle its meaning. And in this case, the eyes of faith that we have is the evangelist John. I have no doubt that certainly one of the reasons, if not the main reason, John writes on <coughs> the feeding of the 5,000, and this is important, is to teach about the abundance a life in Christ gives. Unfortunately, this um, the NIV, its translation is not that, in my opinion, not that helpful. I think it's in John 10.10, 10, isn't it, Soil? I believe that's where it is where it talks about, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. And wasn't there a devotional called The Abundant Life for years? I believe there was. Um, in 10.10, in 10, I'm pretty sure it's translated, you might have it to the full. But the, but the correct interpretation, you might have it abundantly. You might have it uh, in such a way that you'll be super satisfied, is what the word abundant means. And I think that's what John wants us to see, that if a person is in Christ, regardless of uh, his or her economic position, situation, be they wealthy or be they poor, uh, regardless of whatever their um, physical uh, life may be, whether they be in health or whether they be in not health, whether they be diseased, for example, uh, whether they be in prison or whether they be not in prison, in other words, their, their political situation, None of that matters. The only thing that matters is whether you live a life in Christ. Because if you live a life in Christ, you live an abundant life. I have wanted to put a note in here. I'll just make the note right now. Um, this passage, uh, I, well, I know why it's been misinterpreted, because of greedy ministers. It has nothing. When they're talking about an abundant life, they're not talking about a physically good life, necessarily. They're not talking about having a lot of money, necessarily. They're not talking about uh, the blessings that Brent and I have living out in the middle of nowhere and the deer and everything else come by. That is not what they're talking about. The abundant life is a life that's lived with Christ. And it makes no difference what your circumstances are in are. All that matters is that you live richly and fully and uh, uh, in a satisfied way with Jesus Christ. And that I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure I know that's what John wants us to see and that's what he's talking about, and I'll mention this in a moment, in this particular miracle. And so it is, in this regard, um, <clears throat> John echoes, or maybe for that matter, he affirms the triumphant praise of Paul and Philippians, and we've done this before, and I tell people, young people, old people, old people that are young at heart, um, this is one of these passages that that you would that you would do well to to write in your hearts. Um, and I want to to share this with you once again. This is in uh, chapter four and uh, of Philippians, and I'll begin in in I think verse ten if I can find it without my glasses on. Um, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Paul is writing. I'm not saying this because I'm in need. Now, this is what he says. I, and I, the reason I love this is because I know this personally is true. I mean, I know this is personally is true because this is what happened in my life, and this was a turning point in my life. Um, um, 30 years ago. Okay. 
I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I'm talking about me. I know, uh, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. People ought to write that and put that on your doorway when you walk out into your garage to get into your car. But you have to experience that living an abundant life in Jesus before it makes sense. Anyway, I think John is echoing that or else he's affirming what he received. I don't know. Part. A major part of the ministry of Jesus was to open the eyes of his followers to embrace exactly this abundant life in him. And throughout his life and ministry, he was greeted with doubt, skepticism, derision, and of course eventually he was murdered. But mostly he was met with doubt. And this is what Philip does. And it is his response to Jesus' Jesus's question, where shall we buy bread for these people? that Philip exposes his lack of knowledge of who Jesus really is and who Jesus really is for him. You see, for Philip, he responds out of a sense of scarcity. And that's what drives him, a fear of scarcity. And that's what drives a lot of people. Philip considers what he doesn't have to solve the problem before him. Okay? How am I going to serve, or are we going to serve 5,000 people? Well, I don't have anything, so it can't be taken care of. And because he, Philip, doesn't have the resources to provide for the masses, nothing can be done. Nothing can be done. Because he lives his life out of a concern of scarcity. Of meagerness. And even Andrew, who follows him in this uh, story, isn't a whole lot better. And there, right in front of Philip, and there, right in front of Andrew, standing right next to them, is Jesus, the abundant life, who... As the scripture reads, quote, distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. And John wants us to understand all one ever needs is provided by Jesus and provided richly. There is a parallel to this passage, and it's a rather grim one when I mentioned this before, when Jesus is standing in front of Pilate, and Pilate, you know, asks him, what is the truth? And he's standing right in front of the truth, and he can't recognize Jesus. And here you've got these guys who are following Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. He's my Lord and Savior. I'll do anything for him. I'll lie down my life for him. I love him so much. Mm, mm, mm. But standing right in front of them is the answer, Jesus, is the answer to the problem that they have and they can't even see it. John wants us to understand again, all one ever needs is provided by Jesus Christ and provided abundantly. That means overflowingly. But our world says otherwise. And since, our, and since most are in Congress with the world, <coughs> even if calling themselves Christian, not all that many really take Christ's offer of an abundant life that seriously. 
few really believe, as Paul and John, that I can can't accomplish all things through Jesus who gives me strength. People don't believe that. They don't believe that. Christians don't believe that. If this so-called Christian nation of ours really believed in Christ, there would be far less malnourishment, there would be uh, better medical care, and there would be less than 40% of the people, according to the HT, who never gets anything wrong, uh, that live in poverty. Forty <coughs> percent in this wonderful little community, where I have this little happy kingdom, forty percent are below the poverty line in this Christian community. We're a Christian nation that believes in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, it's just too damn bad that a third of the people are going to bed hungry today. That's their problem. It's not Jesus' problem, it's their problem. But we're a Christian nation. We believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. A third of the people are hungry tonight, and that's okay. Because we believe in Jesus. I believe it. I don't believe a word of that, that it's okay. I think it's an abomination. <coughs> and I think we're going to be judged severely for our selfishness. Even as we are already being judged. Truth be known... We, this Christian nation, does not believe in Jesus and take him at its word. Rather, what we do is we believe the word of the world. And the world says you can't feed 5,000 people because you don't have the money. You can't heal the people because the money we spend has to go for this and not for cures for cancer. The world says we can't take care of people uh, who are confused. This is what the world says. And this is what our Christian nation agrees to. Oh, the judgment. The judgment is serious. The judgment is coming. The judgment is already upon us. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. You see, if we believe in Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we would believe that Jesus Christ and I can accomplish all things through Him who gives me the strength. But we don't believe that. We don't believe a word of that. We don't believe a word of that. But we do believe the word of the world. And that is our Lord and our Savior. Judgment is coming. It is already here. Amen. In number 491, stand up and bless the Lord. Please stand. <laughs>
<laughs> Let's sing Jesus Lost Me This I Know. <laughs> All right? thanks for that. Blessings upon those people in this church that suffer. May they be healed. Blessings upon those church, those members of this church who are confused. May they be straightened. Bless those whose hearts have been broken. Bless those who are afraid. There is no fear in Jesus. Bless each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.